Okay, just by way of housekeeping, first of all, I want to apologize because I promised last week that at the end of the session, I would leave time for a Q&A, a few minutes for Q&A, and I completely forgot about it. So I need a couple of people, if it looks like I'm going to forget it again at the end of this session, to remind me, because I, I want to leave room for the questions. The next thing is uh, we will come back, tonight is the third session, we will come back two weeks from today and, and uh, complete the series. I'm going to cover through verse 15 today, and I promise you in the last session we will get through the rest of, of the uh, of this short epistle. As I mentioned in week one, uh, I had decided that I was going, I'm, I've been trying to uh, pursue my life and service of faith to our Lord in a somewhat different manner than, than I had had in the past. I was really relying on the Lord's leading me to what he wants me to do next. So I don't go looking for anything. Just say, okay, Lord, if you want me to do something, then I need you to lead me to it. And that's kind of the way I am pursuing ministry until the time that the Lord calls me home. And so when Pastor Roman, I trusted that Pastor Ro that God was going to speak to me through Pastor Roman. Pastor Roman said Jude, and as I mentioned to you, I struggled with this somewhat, not with Pastor Roman, because I understood that, that the Lord, the Spirit was speaking to me, this is what I want you to do through the voice of Pastor Roman. And it was a struggle for me because I have taught through this book more times than I can remember, than I can count over the course of, of, uh, of my life of ministry. As a matter of fact, when we were in Bible school, and you know, Doug and I were in Bible school together, oftentimes we would get called out to do pulpit supply in different churches in, you know, in, in, uh, in the tri-state region. And every time that I went out, I would always preach Jude. In the morning, I would do the first half of Jude, and in the evening, at the evening service, I would cover the second half because its, mes its message I saw back then was very crucial uh, to the things that I saw happening. And so this was a struggle for me, and then as I shared with you, uh, you know, I started forward thinking, and then something else arose this week that has caused me to see, yeah, this is, this is really important for this time, even if it's your hundredth time teaching it. I started reading this book this week by a man who was a psychiatrist. I think he was a Dutch psychiatrist, and he was, he was imprisoned in a Nazi prison camp during World War II. And during his time there, he, he kind of began to, began to observe how, how the, uh, the, the, uh, the Nazi guards were, were subjecting the prisoners who most of them were troops, to interrogation methods and how they were dividing them and would actually get them to finally break down and lose all hope for survival and actually become collaborators for the enemy. And then he went on from there after he, obviously he survived the uh, Nazi prison camp and went on in the field of psychiatry and then did a study after the Korean War. Now the the, the methods employed during the Korean War were even more refined than the Nazis had and how they would break down uh, the American prisoners bit, bit by bit through different forms of torture, but the predominant one being psychological torture. And what they would first do in order to make a soldier pliable is they would have to divide the soldiers one from another and actually turn them against each other. And then finally they could isolate them in that way and break them down and finally get them to the point where they would actually uh, renounce their US citizenship and become collaborators with, in this case, the Korean, you know, the Korean communists and actually write letters testifying to the fact that American troops had used biological weapons on the Chinese people, which of course weren't true, and they actually believed it. Well, the author goes on to say, and this is, this is the point here, 
The author goes on to say, is, and this book was written in the 19, ni late 1950s, early 60s, the author goes on to say that as a society, we have to be very careful because these tactics can not only be used on the in, at the individual level, but they can be used at the population level as well. And the way you break people down is you divide them. That's the first step. That's the key step in, in breaking people down is you divide them. And so uh, I, want to, uh, I want to say this to you, and I'm not really one for a lot of political commentary, but I think it, this is important enough for me to say to you that it's important for you to know as a conservative, it's important for you to know as a Republican or a right-wing person that the same tactics that are being used by the leftists on the liberals are also being used by you from those on the right. And the whole point is to, is to break people down and divide them. Because you may think that this is a shocking statement that I'm going to make, but I want you to think about it for a moment. That the conservative needs the liberal thinker every bit as much as the liberal thinker needs the conservative, okay? Because the liberals are the ones who tend to be the innovators and the ones who tend to drive things forward, while the conservatives are supposed to be the ones who say, no, 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 you're going too far, let's pull this back, let's get it. And so what you see happening is happening by design. And so under this, and really what it is is, what, what you're not, most people aren't recognizes is that in mass now we're being subjected to techniques that were refined in the prison camps and in the torture camps and they're being used now on the population at large to generate fear, to generate anxiety. These are also components of psychological warfare in order to divide the people. Okay. Well, what does this, any of this have to do with Jude? Well, here it is. The author noted that what made the soldiers that he studied and the interviews that he conducted the most resilient to this kind of psychological warfare was that no matter how bad the physical or the psychological torture ever got, they never lost hope. They never lost faith. You know why? Because they believed in something bigger than themselves. They believed that there was a purpose to their suffering. Okay, why is this important? Well, because now I want to fast forward for a moment to the third, let me get past this, this slide here. Now, over the last two weeks, I've spent quite a bit of time talking about we're here in the last period of the church age, and I even introduced this period to you, but there is that one there that represents the last seven, the last period of seven years before the second coming of Christ. And I also mentioned to you that during that seven period, there would be a, a great multitude that would be brought to saving faith through the worldwide evangelistic pro program of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. But here's what I want you to do for a moment. I want you to try for a moment in your mind to put yourself in the place of one of these people who are brought to saving faith during this time period here. What it will be like for them. If any of you have read anything in the book of Revelation, you'll know that they are going to be subjected to great torture. They're going to be subjected to, to a, a, a degree of pressure and coercion to renounce their faith, to give up, uh, that, that the world has, not, that Christianity has, quite frankly, not experienced since the time of the Roman persecution. Now, what is it? that will keep them strong? What is it that will cause them to persevere? Well, what will cause them to persevere and not give up hope 
is the same thing that causes us, even in our time, to persevere and to have hope when we go through difficult periods. And that is this faith that has been passed down to us, that has been kept pure through the determination, through the sacrifice of countless thousands of people who have come in this long chain before us, stretching all the way from, way, all the way back bef from Moses all the way up until this time period. There, there have been people who understood that the things that God has committed to us are more precious than anything else. And so we have a role to play in this. And the role that we have to play in this is that we have to be willing to do our part. We have to be willing to make whatever sacrifices that we have to make to ensure that the precious thing that was handed down to us by the countless thousands of faithful people before us, we will be as faithful in handing them over to those who will come after us because they will need it, most especially in that final seven-year period. It gets so bad there that in Revelation chapter 14, it actually says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Do you know that, that in the tribulation, uh, when, when a believer is finally succumbs to the, to to the torture, and, and we are told that, that that's, that's the admission price for a tribulation saint, is you're going to be martyred for your faith that it's actually, God views it as actually a blessing because they're spared many of the plagues that are gonna come upon the earth. Okay, let me back up now and we're gonna continue on uh, today. Okay, so the battlefield is the church. This is where the war takes place. This war that you are, you, you, it, this is not optional for you. You don't to get to decide, hey, you know what? I'm not, really, I'm not really into this. I don't have a great theological mind. You know, I'm not a people person. I'm not confrontational. So I'm just going to go off on the sidelines and do something else. This is not optional for you. You are going to have to give, each one of us is going to have to give an account to Christ at the Bema Seat how we have done our very best to observe or neglect this command to earnestly contend for the faith because the battlefield is in here. It's not out there. So the church is the battlefield. We're called into a contest, and to the victor goes the spoils. And what's up for grab is the once for all delivered faith. This is what the contest is all about. And, and, uh, and church, by and large, by and large, the church today is losing this battle. It's being surrendered, church by church. First of all, it, okay, let me go this way with it. It's being surrendered church by church. It's being surrendered denomination by denomination. But you know what? Those two methods of surrender cannot happen unless it's being first surrendered at the individual level. And that's where this is taking place. And it's always in the heat of battle where true courage and the colors of soldiers are manifest. So this is God's sovereign design. And, and I've said this over the years, that in the church, God is always working a twofold program. One is of salvation and the other one is of damnation. Do you know that, that it is true that God calls people into the assembly, into the place where God's people gather to enter into judgment with them there? And that's what Jude says, that these men were foreordained to this, to, this, to this path. So God brings them into the church and he enters into judgment with them in the church. So thus God has ordained that false prophets would both come into the church from the outside and rise up from within. Paul's, Paul's final, final exhortation to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. Watch out for the wolves who are gonna come in from the outside and, and be on your guard because while you're distracted by the wolves from the outside, perverse men will rise up from the inside seeking to draw off the disciples after themselves. So they come in as pied pipers and lead those astray who have become sluggish in their faith. And you know what? Uh, if you become sluggish in your faith 
and you, do, you go to that place of stagnation where you're not moving forward anymore, uh, according to Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6, God may, as a, as a means of chastisement, leave you there, not allow you to exit that place of stagnation. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Your salvation is by grace through faith, but it has something to do. There, there is something that God requires that we put ourselves into. He just doesn't zap all this information into us. He commands that we pursue it. And so, uh, and so if you become sluggish in your faith, you now become prey for one of these grace changers to come in. And, and they don't come in wearing black hats, as I said before. And they don't necessarily always come in as guest speakers or people coming into the church with all of these big promises. You know, they could come in as an individual in just your life. And if you're sluggish in your faith, if you're not growing in your knowledge of the Lord and of the things of God, then you are making yourself prey to these individuals coming into your lives. And make no mistake about it, that the adversary, the devil, and his minions, they're keeping a close eye on what you are doing and not doing, and they will use this to their advantage to take you down. And once they take you down, you see, it's like throwing a pebble in, in, a, in a pond. You know, you, that, there's that one initial drop, but there are rings that spring out, and, and, it, uh, and it springs out. And this is talked about in the New Testament, where the Apostle Paul, I believe it is, talks about not letting a, a root of bitterness uh, creep up, and by that one root of bitterness, many become defiled. Well, it works the same way here. If you become sluggish in your faith, you become prey for the adversary, he's going to come in, he's going to take advantage of you, and once he's taken advantage of you, now you will essentially be a tool that he begins to impact the lives of others. So God will, and God will use this experience in your life to chastise you for being sluggish. And then there are goats in reality. Don't automatically assume that everyone who walks through, the, through those front doors is legitimately a child of God because we have very clear indication throughout the New Testament that God is going to allow the counterfeit to come in among the authentic in order to try, in order to test, in order, in order to purify, in order to mature the true. And so God calls us all to choose what side we will be on. And the, the choice is really determined by what we do, not what we say. Now, at the conclusion of my session last week, I, I asked those of you who would be willing to make a commitment or a covenant to do better in this area and to begin to familiarize yourself with this. This is not the scriptures, but this is, this is a guide that will take you through the scriptures and solidify your understanding, which then you would be able to convey to your children, and this is how it moves forward. So if memory serves me, and at this point it still does somewhat, most of you stood up and said, yeah, I'm going to do that. Now, if you've been faithful to that command, if you've been faithful to that promise over this week, would you raise your hand? Oh, a lot less hands up. Now, that doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that, that uh, you know, you're an unfaithful person. Um, but the reality is, is that there are distractions that come along, aren't they? Aren't there? I mean, we get busy. The car breaks down. The crock, crock pot's not working. You know, uh, my tan lines are not where they should be. Just making it. What's that? Oh, okay, so there you go. There's your get out of jail free card. Blame Pastor Roman. He didn't give you the doctrinal statement, right? But it, that's the way it happens. It happens very subtly and happens very slowly. Now, I, I'm not bringing this forward to chastise you over it, but just to remind you that this is important, and it was important enough last Sunday that you made 
a promise to do it. Okay, all right, with that said now, we've already covered this slide, uh, and we know that there's a, a forewarning in the scripture that at the time of the end, the battle would, would intensify exponentially, and indeed the grace changers would appear to have gained the victory, and they, it does appear that they have gained the victory in the church, uh, but let's not fear, because this is all part of God's plan. And, that, and that's the other thing I want to mention about all of the chaos that we see happening in the world all around us, right against left, Antifa this, Proud Boys that, you know, and, and uh, it's polarizing us. It's polarizing us as a society. And what it's doing is it's breaking our focus. Our focus should be on things eternal, not things temporal. Because the reality is all of this is going away. It's all going away. And, and God is going to bring something new. And you are, going to be, you are going to be in that something new. So while we don't want to completely disengage from the world around us, don't get so pulled into it that it breaks your sight from having eyes for eternity. Okay, because that's ultimately where, where we're headed. One day, we don't know when, God is going to call each one of us through, through that gate into eternity. And so the time that we have, it's important to redeem the time, and it's important to, to understand these things and to do our very best to pass them on. But ultimately, God is in control uh, of all of this, right? And so over the years, a question have I asked, I've asked myself, given the fact that the scripture talks about that there would always be goats in among the sheep, how do I recognize, how do I know the difference? How can I, what are the red flags that tell me that I may be dealing with a goat here, especially when you're in the role of, of a pastor, you know, this becomes even more critical for, for a pastor because the pastor is literally walking around with a bullseye on his back, right? How do I know whether I'm dealing here with someone who is legitimately a child of God, but they've just kind of, you know, they've become sluggish in their faith or they're, they've gone off to the side, they've gone off sideways somewhere. How do I know that I'm dealing with one of those and that I'm not in reality dealing with someone who is, a, who is counterfeit, who is a goat, who is someone who's been sent here by the enemy to not only take me down, but to lead the sheep astray. Well, that's actually what Jude is all about, right? We're gonna to get to that in the final session. We'll look clearly at that. But here's, here's one thing that is a primary thing to look for is whether or not an individual is willing to engage in this battle, right? That's it, it should be a wholehearted thing. If you stop and think about what God's word has done for you, the depths that you have found yourself in, in your soul and in your life, where, where have, let me just ask you this question point blank. Has anyone ever here ever been in a place where you were so cast down, where you were so far down in either physical or mental trial or tribulation or, or despair or depression that you despaired of life? Now I know some of you were there because you came to me for counsel during this time. Now imagine what God's word did for you during that time period. In many cases, it was, it was not only the very last thing that kept you from falling into that abyss of hopelessness, but it was the method by which God used to extricate you out of that deep and desperate and hopeless place to a place of rejoicing and saying, I've made it, I survived, I'm alive, I've gotten stronger. And that's what we're called to pass on to other people. But here's the thing. What really distinguishes the true from the false is not what comes out of our mouth, but what we actually do. 
you see? That, that, the, that the word and its precepts and all of the things become incarnate within, they, they come to life into this dark world through us. You are the light of the world, right? We are the light of the world. We don't hide that light under a bushel, right? It, we're, we're supposed to manifest it to everyone around us. But that manifestation doesn't just come as cheap talk. It comes with talk that's accompanied by actually living it out. When God's word says, you are the light of the world, well, what does that look like? What does that look like in real life? I don't walk around with a light bulb on my head. What, is, what does that look like? And, and this is what God's word gives to us. And this is what is being contested here. You see? And there is the counterfeit that, that is being substituted very subtly, yet very effectually in all of this, in its, in its loading people towards the experiential side of it. That's important, you know, being able to to have a subjective experience of the presence of God is important, but it has to be balanced by the objective truth, by the objective knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And this is what's up for grabs here. And you are the ones who are supposed to contend earnestly for this. Not just me, not just Pastor Roman, you know, one day, you know, God only knows when, could be tomorrow, could be 10 years from now, I'm going to get called home. And you will have to, you young people, you young parents who are now maybe in your 30s, you will have to be the ones to carry the torch, the torch forward, and you will have to be the ones to pass this down to your children. But you can't pass down to your children what you are not in possession of. And there is an adversary who is trying to skew you into thinking this is not as important as the experience, as the Jesus feeling, as the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's what's up for grabs here. Sorry, I don't mean to rave and rant, but I'm passionate about this. We concluded with this slide last week, woe, misery, sorrow, and distress, the sixth triad. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So Cain, Cain wanted to do his own thing, and so he brought a tithe, but didn't feel like he, he, it was necessary for him to bring a sacrifice. Whereas God approved, of Abel because Abel brought not only a tithe but it was also his sacrifice and so God says to Cain why are you upset don't you know here that you have a choice before you if you do the right thing if you do the same thing and understand just like your brother did that in your approach to me you need to come with a sacrifice of blood that I will enter in and be your God I will be your protector if not then sin will enter in, and it shall be your master, which is exactly what happened. And then Balaam, who was just so, so locked into, he wanted to get paid, in spite of the fact that God told him five times, I'm not going to curse the Israelites. They are a holy people. Forget it. And so he finally figured out a way to get paid, and eventually he did pay. He paid with his life. Because when, when they finally came into the land, he's listed in that, that genealogy of fatalities that were taken out. And then Korah, the, the, those who thought that they were, were all holy, but were not all given the same gifts or the same tasks. This rebellion. Okay, here we go. Let's move on to the seventh and eighth triad now. These are spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness forever. 
Okay, let's unpack these things. There's a lot, a lot here in these uh, two verses. So let's unpack it. The first thing I want you to notice is that word spots. Now, I'm not exactly sure why the English translators use, it, use this phrase spots in your love feast because it, it doesn't really accurately portray what the Greek is saying here. The, the Greek word here is the word spalades, and it actually means hidden reefs. And I'm not exactly sure why they append the word feasts onto love. Now, love is present in the Greek translation, but the word feast is not. It's a supplied word, and I think the point here being is that these people will come into your midst and they will be like hidden reefs in your fellowship, right? And so uh, that, is, that is probably one of the most dangerous hazards that a mariner can face is these hidden reefs. Is your, your, the, you know, the, the boat is, is cruising along or sailing along and it seems like there's a ton of water, all of a sudden they run aground on a hidden reef. And so what is the idea here? The idea here is that these individuals, these false teachers, these false believers, they will come into your, they will come into your midst and they will come up alongside of you and befriend you or you know, the, the thousand different ways that they can gain entrance and influence into your life and into the life of the church and, and if, you, if you're not aware of their presence, if you're not on guard for their presence, their effect on you will be the same as if a ship was cruising along and ran aground on one of these hidden reefs. A, you won't know that it's there until it's too late. And B, the end result will be your forward progress will come to a complete stop. See? There it is. That's the... That's the agenda, to keep you from moving forward in your faith. So, so Jude here tells us is that these false prophets, these false believers will come in, and if you're not watching out for them, if you're not prepared for them, when they have their way with you, their effect will be is that they, they will stop you, they will stop your forward progress in the faith. Again, nothing to do with salvation right because we're saved by grace through faith but what it does impact is it impacts our journey to spiritual maturity and that's the aim as i've said now over the last two sessions he's too smart the adversary is too smart he knows he can't take away your salvation but if he can stop your forward progress he can somehow hinder or diffuse your effects, effectiveness for the growth of the kingdom of God and the testimony of the gospel. Okay, so it's an unseen obstruction in seemingly open waters and in marine navigation, this is the number one, um, number one danger. Now notice here what it says in 1 Timothy because it really touches upon this. In 1 Timothy chapter 18, verse one, uh, 18 to 20, it says this, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Harmonius and Alexander, whom I deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now I want you to notice, you know, we read this, but we have to stop and think about it, that there's a trajectory here that leads to shipwreck that, that Paul is, is telling Timothy to be on guard against. And that trajectory starts with rejecting the faith or rejecting faith, or, or that is, you know, we're, we're called to live our lives based upon faith. What are we to have faith in God for? What are some of the things that we are called to have faith in God for? Doug? Atonement, right? We know, we know, we know that. That's the entrance point, right? That, that we are 
that God has, that has saved us for no intrinsic worth or reason within us. He has saved us. Okay, what else are we called to live by faith according to in? Pastor Roman? The way we raise our families, Max? Direction, right? In what areas? In every area. The point being is this. People, we are called to live by faith in everything. See, that, that's the faith that we're called to. God calls us to live by faith in everything, to live by faith in the fact that, you know what? I'm not going to live my life worrying when I'm going to die or if I'm going to get COVID-19 because by faith, I have faith that I believe that God's word, when it says that the moment of my death has been ordained before the foundation of the world, that nothing is going to change that. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be an idiot about it and run down to the local store and buy a quart of sulfuric acid and drink it like iced tea. But it doesn't become a controlling factor in my life. Because if it can become a controlling factor in my life or in your life, it becomes a controlling factor in your testimony for the gospel. But see, that's what happens if you're not watching out for these guys, is they'll stop you for progress. So having faith, they've rejected faith, and the next thing that goes when you stop living by faith is the good conscience, right? You're, you're now doing things your own way. And so there's a trajectory there that ultimately led Hymenaeus and Alexander to shipwreck. And what God is telling us there, be careful, because this is a trajectory of rejecting living by faith and living in a way so that your conscience is not convicting you of doing things you, ought, you know you ought not to be doing because ultimately, you know, we all know this, when we're not doing the things that God's word tells us we ought to be doing, the last thing we want to do is look in God's word, right? It's like, ah, we find a million excuses why I'm not going to open up the Bible today, but ultimately it's because it's, it has convicted us of something that we're not willing to face. We're not willing to have the courage to admit myself, yeah, I'm that guy. And that's how shipwreck comes, and your forward progress stops. Stagnation, it comes to a stop. Got nothing to do with your salvation. All right, then it goes on and it says that they're clouds without water, and this has to be understood from the agricultural mindset. You know, for us, we go to Big Y, we go to Stop and Shop, we get our produce, we get our kale or whatever other disgusting green thing people like to eat, you know, and, and they get it there. Um, you know, but we need to understand that when you're growing crops, and when you are depending upon the soil to yield its produce so that not only so that you could sell some and make money, but also that you could feed your family. You know, so, so the sun, you need a lot of sun, but you also need rain, right? And these guys are like clouds. They come along and they obscure that which is beneficial, which is the sunlight. And you're saying, okay, I'm going to get something in exchange. I'm going to get the water. But they never deliver. And so... Clouds on the horizon brings with it an anticipation of rain, which is good and beneficial for the crops. What it gives in the exchange offsets the temp temporary obscuring of the sunlight, which is also needed. Thus, they come with the anticipation of some blessing or beneficial role. Uh, and notice that they are blown about by the wind. And so they would like nothing better then for you to blow about by every wind, be blown about by every wind right along with them. And God has instituted a mechanism to keep that from happening, right? And it's here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 14. How, how can I kept, how can I keep myself, how can I be intentional and proactive to keep myself from being swept up when one of these clouds without water 
enters into my life and on the surface it looks like they're going to be good for me and so I will tolerate them pulling me away from my fellowship, pulling me away from my devotionals because I'm going to get something that I perceive to be of spiritual benefit to me in the exchange. How do I keep myself from falling for that sucker's bet? Well, here it is. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. You notice there, it doesn't say anything about psychotherapists or psychologists or tarot card readers. It's all objective. Some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, that is to a spiritually mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So there it is. That's how you do it. You submit yourself to those that God has placed over you to bolster you up and to prepare you for these things. So in the end, these clouds without water, they don't deliver, they only obscure what is beneficial. Trees, late autumn trees. Trees lose their leaves as they go dormant for the winter, appear to be dead even though they're still alive. Twice dead means in reality dead, but that won't be manifest until the fruit producing season comes once again. You see, it takes time to discern whether a tree is actually dead or just dormant. So twice dead means it's gone through its dormant stage, should be alive, should be producing fruit, but it's not, it's twice dead. So what it's essentially saying is they're spiritually dead. There's no spiritual life within them. They are unbelievers, as Jude has been reiterating right from the start here. Jude says they will be plucked out by the roots as farmers destroy trees that won't produce fruit. Waves, foaming, wandering stars. Here's the eighth triad. Raging waves of the sea, that is troubled seas, raging waves, fierce, savage. You know, and, and, and when you learn a little bit about boating, you have to learn a little bit about the different sea states that are possible because they affect how you operate your boat in those waters, right? And so if you have a quartering sea, you do this. If you have a head sea, you do that. If you have a following sea, you do that. But the one that is the most dangerous is the confused sea state, right? Where there's just waves going every direction. There's, there's no way for you to get through that in any kind of pleasant way. And that is, that is at the time when you are really um, susceptible to being swamped. So that's what it says these guys are. They're, they're raging waves. There's no, there's no stability. There's no pattern. There's, it's all erratic. It's all confused. Savage. Foaming up their own shame. So this is an interesting word in the Greek. It's a compound word, and it's made up of these two words, ep, which is a, prop, a preposition which means upon, and a friso, which is foaming or frothing at the mouth. And so I thought about this, and ah, I get it. So it's the inward state of turmoil and trouble causes to bubble to the surface the impurities. And you'll notice there that I have in parentheses epileptic seizure, right? Because, because you won't know that a person is epileptic until they have an epileptic seizure, right? So we went through this with my brother. My brother was... He was fine, and then all of a sudden, you know, he started convulsing and, and foaming at the mouth and all of these things, and after some testing, we found out that he was epileptic. So what's the point here? The point here is, is this foaming up their own shame, you, you don't actually know that it's there until it actually manifests itself. And when it manifests itself, it's too late, it's, it's already done its damage. And so you have to be on guard for this. 
Okay, so the inward state of turmoil and trouble causes to bubble to the surface the impurities, epileptic seizures, shame, disgrace, dishonest and shameful deeds. See, a person can hide their true inward nature for only so long, but eventually that bubble is gonna burst, that geyser is gonna pop. And when it pops, this is what pops out of it. Disgrace, dishonest, shameful deeds. Okay, wandering stars, literally planets, planets that do not follow a fixed orbit but are erratic in their motion, literally a comet. The idea here is one of a flash in the pan. We've seen those, have we not? Flash in the pans. They come in with all these big grandiose promises and you think, wow, this person is gonna be a superstar for Jesus and he's gonna be a superstar in this church, right? We've, if you've been walking with Christ for any period of time, you've probably experienced more than a couple of these flash in the pans. They arrive on the scene with their, and with their arrival bring the promise of doing something very big, very extraordinary, but in the end, they don't deliver, they just move on, right? The church hoppers. They're not steady, they're not stable, you cannot count on them. When the chips are down, you'll be on your own. And Jude says, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? It's appointed for them. Okay. So let's start pulling this all together now into some um, truth statements. Okay. They are forever stirring up discontent within the congregation. This is what they do. This is what they come in to do. They come in to stir up discontent within the congregation. And they may not necessarily be the ones to directly stir up the discontent, but they may gain influence over another person in the church who has become sluggish in their face. All the things that I've talked about and begin to probe them and needle them and subliminally Im, you know, impart these things to them which they in turn begin to spread out. So they cause discontent within the church. They tell us we are missing something God has for us. And an untrained minds begin to consider their words while forgetting the scripture. But the Bible teaches that we every, everything we need in reality and what we have received in Christ. Second Peter chapter one, verses two and three says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through what? Through feelings, through experience. No, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. That's right here, beloved. It's all right here. Everything you need is right here. And I have been studying this book intensely for over 30 years now. And honestly, there are passages that I encounter that I just, honestly, I feel like I'm just wearing a big dunce cap. I don't get it. So there's never an end to the knowledge that's contained here. Everything that we need is in this book right here. Okay, and so don't let anyone ever beguile you of that. And that's what this is for. This is to help solidify you, to show you step by step that all of the big questions of life, it, that they're all here, the answers are all here. And this will, this will help solidify that in your mind, okay. And then finally, talks about Enoch in verses 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, behold the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so now this is the second quote from an apocryphal writing. The first one was from the Assumption of Moses, and this is from the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is, is still, you can, it's viewable online. You can find it anywhere online. And for a long time it was thought that this was a spurious book. In other words, that it was something that was written much later 
in the historical record until they found the full intact copy in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it is a legitimate Jewish apocryphal writing. It's not inspired, but how do we know? Here's a question for you. How do we know that these verses out of the book of Enoch are inspired? How do we know that? How do we know that they're inspired, that they're God-breathed, Mark? Yeah, because they're in the Bible, right? So we know that these, this, this part of it is inspired because it's in the scriptures. And so I've got the actual quote out of the book of Enoch here, and you'll see the highlighted area at the bottom of this chapter is, is the verbatim quote that Jude uses. I'm not going to read it because uh, we're running out of time. But you'll, if you were to read that, you'd see it very closely parallels a lot what you read in the apocalyptic Old Testament prophets and even in the book of Revelation. So in conclusion for today, their impact in the church, they come in or rise up, they ridicule and disparage what the church and her leaders are trying to do in a very subtle way, person by person, man by man. It's never a frontal open Assault. It's always sly, subliminal, divide and conquer. All of those tactics are used. The tactics that I mentioned to you that, you know, that I'm reading about that were employed by the Nazis, that were employed by later the Koreans, and then, you know, so on and so forth, the torturers, right? They're all minions of the adversary. They get their ideas from the adversary. Well, we have the same adversary and they're going to use the same tactics against you. You need to be aware of that. They come in or rise up and assert their own agenda, which has at its base their prime directive of feeding themselves rather than feeding the flock. Like true false teachers, they see the flock not as an entity that needs to be fed, but as a food source. There. There it is at its ba most basic level. These false teachers they don't see you as someone that needs to be encouraged and someone that needs to be cared for. They see you as prey. You're their food. They seek to change the course and direction uh, that the church is traveling on, right? So this church is on a specific direction right now, right? been on a specific direction for quite some time. This church has a, a long history of orthodoxy and, and, with, and holding to the faith. And you know what? From a historical perspective, this church has bucked the statistical norm because the statistical norm is, is that any church will only remain in, this, in a place of orthodoxy for two or three spiritual generations at the most. This church is well beyond there. It falls to you now to carry that forward, right? So you've got to know. You've got this, and, and you're also training up, you know, in the Christian school, all of those things. You've got to know that the adversary is going to come at you, and he's going to try and shift the ad agenda of the church, right? Okay. They rock the church with scandal after scandal, and when they've done their work, they just move on to the next place. Okay. And in the end, what is their work? To discourage the flock, to discourage the leadership, and thus cause a course change, or even better yet, forward progress altogether. And thus they make sh shipwreck of the faith of some, and many times even make shipwreck of the vision of the church. This is what they're out to do. You are the ones who are to stop it. You know what, I'm, I'm coming to the end, you know, of my, I don't, and when, by the end, I'm not saying I think God is going to take me this week or next week, but the reality is, is I'm on the back side of the mountain. And I'm coming down the back side of the mountain now, right? And so soon, who knows when, my work will be over. And I'm going to work every single day, you know, to be able to say I have, I have run the race, 
I have finished the task. I have done everything in my power to do what God has given me to do, and now I'm ready to receive my reward. That's what I'm striving for in the later years of my life. Everything else is secondary to that. And, but you will have to carry this forward and know that there will be an adversary that is, he knows you, he knows your weaknesses, and he's, gonna, he's coming for you. Whatever way he has to do it, know this, he's coming for you. Okay, in our last session, we're gonna look at the red flags. We're gonna look at what are the things that will tip you off that you may be dealing with one of these grace changers. And then finally, how do we respond?